we need to, as a world or an industry, decide, are we going to do backups the right way, the correct way that we've always said that we're doing them? Or are we going to continue in this kind of fake myth that we're doing them really well, but we're not? Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Hacking Humans podcast, where each week we look behind the social engineering scams, the phishing schemes, and criminal exploits that are making headlines and taking a heavy toll on organizations around the world. I'm Dave Bittner from the CyberWire, and joining me is Joe Kerrigan from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Hello, Joe. Hi, Dave. Got some good stories to share this week. And later in the show, my conversation with Roger Grimes. He is the data-driven defense evangelist at Before. Hey, so this is your boss speaking. I'm going to need you to go ahead and wire transfer some company funds to an account that I'll send you. I'm going to need that done today. Don't worry about clearing it through finance. They already know about it. I promise. So this is obviously not your boss, but cyber criminals try this exact tactic all the time in the form of email CEO fraud, also known as business email compromise. They'll spoof your CEO or CFO's email address, send finance or HR an email about transferring money or sharing sensitive employee data, and an unsuspecting and untrained employee just might do it. Our sponsor, Know Before, providers of the world's largest security awareness training and simulated phishing platform, know a thing or two about equipping employees to handle these threats. We'll learn how later in the show. All right, Joe, why don't we uh, jump right into some stories this week? Uh, I'm going to start things off for us. And my story actually comes from the folks over at uh, the fact-checking website Snopes. Uh Uh, This is written by Jordan Lyles, uh, and it's titled, We Infiltrated a Crypto Scam Network that's hosted by Meta, uh, the company formerly known as Facebook. Right. (laughs) uh, And uh, this narrative follows the story of some scams that are being run on Facebook in Facebook using a combination of Facebook groups, but also Facebook Messenger. Um, And it starts with a Facebook page that's called Tina's Finance, which is not a real company. Uh, And Tina's Finance uh, starts off with an advertisement with a photograph of uh, billionaire Warren Buffett. uh, And he's holding (laughs) a giant... As they often do. Yeah, and he's holding a giant Bitcoin... (laughs) Uh, And it invites Facebook users to learn about Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. And once you... I'm looking at this picture right now, Dave. It's obviously Photoshopped. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I know. But, you know, I guess it it, it works well enough for these scammers. Yeah. Um, So once you engage with these folks, uh, you go into a group and they promise that uh, funds you invest with them are going to be uh, using a special app, which is called MetaX or MetaX, uh, MetaXC, uh, before your funds are returned. But, of course, the funds are never going to be returned right. back. Yes. Um, so the way it works is uh, you join up with this group and you enter a Facebook uh, group And in that group are a bunch of other people, uh, supposedly like-minded people, who are also interested in learning about cryptocurrency. Uh, When you log in, there's a message that says, we have established a cryptocurrency exchange group. There are professional teachers. Share knowledge in the group. Would you want to join? So a little broken English there (laughs) as a first red flag. Yep. Uh, And they say that this will be a way for you to find a new way to wealth, which evidently is a phrase that they use over and over again. A new way to wealth. Um, a new way to wealth. And okay. um, once you enter this group, there are what are allegedly like-minded people who are also interested in this, but they're not real people. They really? are – well, most of them are uh, other members of the scam group probably. I mean this could all be being run by one person, right? Right. You, uh, so, absolutely. He could yeah. be coming – he could have a bunch of different windows open on his machine coming in from – Multiple machines and multiple browsers all while sitting at the same monitor. Exactly. So uh, they use a combination of this Facebook group but also uh, group chats in Facebook Messenger where they take you down a pathway of uh, other people saying, you know, we're ready to go, ready to invest. Here here we go. And, and then someone who is supposedly the leader of this group says, okay, everyone – 
you know, we're scheduled to make our deposits at this time, at this moment. Everybody ready? And everybody says, yes, we're ready. We're ready. <laughs> so you have this getting on the bandwagon thing, right? All right. these other people are going to be involved in this. And you can see other people saying, oh, I've, you know, I've done so well with this. Can't wait to invest more. That sort of thing. Yeah. So, of course, when you uh, put your money, you you take your cryptocurrency. So you go and you buy some cryptocurrency. And by the way, they're more than happy to help you, to walk you through the process. <laughs> I'm sure they are. <laughs> buying your cryptocurrency. Uh, and then you put your cryptocurrency in this app where it supposedly is going to be invested. Once it's in there, you can see a fake dashboard that shows you how your investment, and investment is in air quotes, is doing uh, right. But if you ask to have your money removed, you'll get a message that says, due to the excessive transaction volume and abnormal system data, the technical department will deal with it and will reply within 24 hours. Right. Right? So yep. what are we doing here, Joe? Well, they're just taking your money. That's, that's they're it. They're taking not- your money, but they're also <laughs> buying time, right? Right. Oh, so that, with that, they're, yeah, they're buying time. Exactly. Yes. They're, yeah, they're yeah, buying yeah. time so that you – I mean, but I, once you've committed the uh, the crypto transfer – into this app, which is really not how cryptocurrency works. You make you make a transfer of uh, cryptocurrency to an address, and mm-hmm. once you do that, I mean, yeah, and there there are apps out there that help you manage it, right? Like I have an app on my phone that has uh, has some cryptocurrency in it. Um, I actually made a cryptocurrency purchase at a cryptocurrency ATM. I've uh, seen a few of those. Yeah. yeah, yeah, recently, and and you know, I was like. You know, I have five bucks. What happens if I lose five bucks? You know, nothing, right? But no, I actually <laughs> got my cryptocurrency, right? Okay. Uh, now, now, I only got $3 worth of cryptocurrency, so I did lose two of those dollars to fees. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that's all part of the transaction fee, Dave. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, this is not like that. This is you're just transferring your crypto, uh, your cryptocurrency to to somebody else's wallet. And then when you go to say, okay, let me have it back, they're like, yeah, yeah, well, give me a minute. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And of course, you will never see that money You'd again. Never see these it again. are That's right. these it's are gone. just scammers. Uh, one of the things that this article points out is that they went and notified Facebook and Messenger, mm-hmm. and weeks went by, and the groups are still up and running. Really? Um, yep. Yep. So be mindful of these sorts of investment things. Uh, again, let your friends and family know about them. Uh, they are scams, and. Um, you know, look, there's no shortage of uh, professional financial advisors in the world. If you're really looking for correct ways to invest right. your money, uh, there's plenty of due diligence you can do without having to jump into a Facebook group to to do something like that. It's disappointing that um, Facebook and, and Meta are not more active in tracking these things down or, or shutting them down with a – when a legitimate uh, – source like Snopes uh, informs them that, hey, there is a scam going on here and here's the evidence that right. that isn't shut down immediately. That's yeah, disappointing. That, that is disappointing. That it, you know, if, if Snopes came to me and said, hey, Joe, we have a scam going on in one of your systems, they would have my immediate attention. I'd be, <laughs> right. If nothing else, I'd be investigating. <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, word to the wise, uh, again, this particular group is called Tina's Finance, but there are lots of them out there. The, any any images of Warren Buffett uh, are a red flag, of course. But right. uh, any images of uh, of actual bitcoins, you know, like the the gold coin that they always hold up. Yeah, I I hate those images. <laughs> <laughs> Again, this is a digital currency. It's not a physical thing. It it doesn't mm-hmm. it doesn't have any real existence. It it exists on a ledger in the in essentially in on the internet. So yeah. I want to say in the cloud, but it's not really the cloud. It's the internet. Uh, yeah. So it's not how these things work. There is no physical picture uh, or thing you can hold in your hand that is a Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, that is my story this week. Of course, we'll have a link to that in the show notes. Joe, what do you have to share with us? Dave, my story comes from Alicia Hope at CPO Magazine. Uh, recently, Electronic Arts, which is a game company, confirmed that attackers use phishing and social engineering tactics to execute account takeovers against high-profile FIFA Ultimate Team gamers. Hmm. Eurogamer, which is a website that uh, talks about video games, first reported the account takeover uh, attacks when they had a bunch of tweets that they noticed were going on. Uh, And these tweets were saying that their accounts had been stripped of FIFA points and coins. 
So apparently okay. you earn coins and, and points in this game, and you can transfer them to other players. Ah. Anytime you have any kind of in-game currency like that, this becomes a target. Sure. Now, I don't play sports video games. I do play video games, but I don't play sports video games. Because I yeah. always say, you know, if I want to play soccer, I will go buy a soccer ball, walk out to the schoolyard behind my house, and then fall on the ground and scream while holding my shin. <laughs> but I digress. <laughs> The attackers reportedly use gamer tags from FIFA, uh, from the FIFA leaderboards, which is – so uh, EA publishes this um, this leaderboard of who's, who's the best FIFA uh, ultimate team players, right? Right, right. And uh, then these guys go, okay, well, I could see their gamer tags. And then they get in touch with EA staff and try to convince them that they are the legitimate owners of these accounts. Mm, mm-hmm. Um. EA account representatives allegedly revealed the account email addresses associated with these gamer tags, right? Which essentially gives them, uh, lets, lets these guys know who the real owners are. It provides a way for them to, okay, so I know the email address of who actually owns this tag. Now I can target that person, right? I see. Huh. Right. The other thing they did was they, these guys actually convinced the EA account representatives to reset passwords, allowing the attackers to just take over the account. Just wow. by calling up and saying, hey, here's my gamertag, reset my password, mm-hmm. right? Gamertag, I guess it's a, analogous to a username here. Huh. Uh, the EA customer service reps actually reset the passwords for these guys, these bad guys. Here's a quote from EA. Using threats and other social engineering methods, individuals acting maliciously were able to exploit human error within our customer experience team and bypass two-factor authentication to gain access to player accounts. So oh. by going directly to EA, they were able to just nullify the protection offered by multi-factor authentication, which yeah. I think is amazing. If I went through the process, uh, we're going to get to that later, but if I went through the process of putting multi-factor authentication on my account and EA just gave my account to somebody else, I would be very upset. Yeah. Uh, uh, EA is doing three things here. They're saying all of their advisors are receiving individualized retraining and additional team training with specific emphasis on the account security practices and phishing techniques used in this particular incident. Hmm. Uh, I, I, I think that's great, but I think you should have broader social engineering training. I think that's uh, very important. Hmm. EA is implementing additional steps to their account ownership verification process, uh, such as mandatory manager approval for email change requests. That's good. Get another set of eyes on the, on the, on the problem, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And finally, their customer software Will their CRM system will be updated to better identify suspicious activity, uh, hmm. flag at risk accounts, and and other other kind of stuff. So what they're doing here is actually a good three pronged approach. They're they're addressing their people, their processes, and their systems, right? Which are the right. three things I I often say you need to think about when you're when you're <laughs> worried about social engineering or actually cybersecurity in any way, mm-hmm, shape, or form. Mm-hmm. Uh, EA disclosed that fewer than fifty accounts have been compromised in their in their press release. However, uh, reports of lower ranking hacked FIFA 22 accounts have also surfaced online, suggesting the, that the number of account takeovers is higher than EA has admitted. Now, here's hmm. my question, Dave. Do you think that EA will effectively restore the access and assets of 100% of people affected by this attack? No, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think, so. think so either. I don't think so either. I don't have an account with EA because they're mainly a, a sports game. Uh, yeah. company and I you know like I said I don't play sports games but I do have accounts with other major companies and if someone took over like my Steam account for example I would lose access to every game I've purchased via the platform mm-hmm. and it's not a ton of games it's like 70 games and a lot of them are bundled together right a lot of them came bundled but right. I'd be very upset especially after losing access to some of the progress I've made in my games that are that are tied to my Steam account yeah right yeah sure like I, the one that comes to mind is World Warships. You know, I, I got tier eight ships, which are pretty high level ships, and it take, took me a long time and a lot of playing. If I lost that overnight, I'd be furious. <laughs> I'm I'd sure be you absolutely would. furious. Where's my North Carolina, Dave? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I have experienced that myself for sure. Had games that I've spent a lot of time making my way through, and and for whatever reason. Uh, through a system update or a device update or something like that, lost my progress or lost oh, yeah. the uh, 
you know, special, uh, what do you call it? Like heroes that I've purchased for the game or whatever. Oh, and, yeah, um, that would make me very upset. Yeah. <laughs> very yeah. upset indeed. Uh, you know, I mean, that's, yeah, I, it is upsetting. Um, uh, but, uh, I, I, I suspect I probably get less upset than you do. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, I might call and and, and be very angry, which is right. you know this the exact social engineering technique that these guys used here. Uh, right, would <laughs> right. would be my natural response. Uh-huh. Uh huh. You know, I don't know. I don't know what I'd do. I mean, I, at that point in time, I might just walk away from everything and just be done with it. Yeah, that's and sometimes that's what you. Do. I mean, yeah, I've had that happen too. I, well, I guess I'm done with this game, right? Because exactly. I'm not. I'm not doing that again. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Let me find something new. <laughs> yeah, if I yeah. lost access to all those, all those, uh, you know, battleships, and or actually, you know, not just battleships, but my favorite, the destroyers. Uh, if I lost access to those things, I, I would be. I, I would not do that again. I would not go through that process again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's sometimes there's a cleansing element to that sort of loss as well. Or yeah, the, there is. Yeah, maybe <laughs> being, being forced uh, to move on. What well, am I going to do okay. with all my free time now? <laughs> <sighs> right. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, uh, interesting story, and of course, we will have a link to that in the show notes. Uh, we would love to hear from you if you have a story you'd like us to cover or a catch of the day. You can email us at hackinghumans at the cyberwire dot com. Speaking of Catch of the Days, it is time to move on to our Catch of the Day. Joe, what do we have this week? Dave, our Catch of the Day comes from a listener named Jesse who writes, I listen to your show every week and you guys are awesome. Hey, thanks, Jesse. Yeah. I'm happy to let you know that I can drop out of school and I don't have to listen to your show anymore as I just got a text from Facebook, and I've won $600,000. Wow. Congratulations, yes. Jesse. I think Jesse's being facetious, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're lucky that uh, Jesse sent a long text message. I'll read it. It says, Hello, my name is Cheryl Sandberg, the chief operating officer of Facebook. Nice meeting you. I was assigned to contact you from the CEO of Facebook, Mr. Mark Zuckerberg. There is an online draws that was conducted by random selection, you were picked by CEO of Facebookin' order to claim your 600,000 USD. Click on the link to claim your cash prize. Congratulations in advance. <laughs> and it's got a link that was sent to him. This is interesting that this came via a text message, just an mm-hmm. SMS message, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, they well. call this smishing. I hate that term. Uh, I hate a lot of these terms that we use in, in the cybersecurity <laughs> world, but smishing is, I mean, this is just phishing via via text message. It doesn't need to have a different name, smishing, because it comes mm-hmm. from a text message. The, the technique is the same. But this is exactly uh, exactly the kind of thing that you see all the time. It's simple. It's unbelievable. But it works because somebody will go, who's Sheryl Sandberg? And then they'll Google Sheryl Sandberg and find out that, yes, Sheryl Sandberg is, in fact, the uh, chief operating officer of Facebook. Right. And then they'll, if they don't know who Mark Zuckerberg is, I know a lot of people do know who Mark Zuckerberg is. They'll, they'll say, uh, if they don't know that, they'll Google that and they'll go, oh, hey, this adds up. This all makes sense. Um, sure. And the person to, that does that is the exact person they're looking for here. Yeah. Uh, the person who is curious and may not know the information also may not know that this is a scam. And that's kind of mm-hmm. what they're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. That, that trusting person. Who also might think, well, what do I have to lose? Right, exactly. Right? And, and you, the answer is plenty. a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what happens when you click on this link. Um, right. You know, it's it's probably. I mean, I guarantee you the link is it, the link is in some way malicious. It it may mm-hmm. ask you. It may just be a, an attempt to steal your Facebook credentials. Right. Yeah. Uh, which is a, a route to another scam. It could be a. Uh, a malware installation page that does, uh, you know, a drive-by download or something that exploits some vulnerability on your on your phone that you have. Mm-hmm. It could be any number of things, but my guess is if you click on this, you're going to see a fake Facebook login page. Yeah, 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 probably could be. All right. Well, again, thanks to uh, Jesse for sending that in to us. And again, we would love to hear from you. It's hackinghumans at the cyberwire.com. Now, a word from our sponsor, Know Before. 
They see the way to address the ongoing problem of CEO fraud as multi-pronged. One, see if your work email domain is vulnerable to spoofing. Know Before has a free tool that will do just that called the Domain Spoof Test, available at knowbefore.com slash DST. Two, if a CEO fraud email does get through, well-educated employees are your best last line of defense against lost funds and a bruised corporate reputation. Regular repeated simulating phishing tests and training are the best way to equip employees against these threats. So check out the domain spoof test that's at knowbefore.com slash DST. Think of Knowbefore for your security training. Joe, I recently had the pleasure of speaking with Roger Grimes. He is the data-driven defense evangelist at Know Before, a company you may have heard of from... Yes, uh, uh, well, they, they, they sponsor the show. Our show. <laughs> so here's my conversation with Roger Grimes. Well, you know, I think certainly overall, it's <laughs> just ransomware attacking everyone. It's probably most people, most IT people's overriding concern. I think... They've calculated that it hit at least 50% of all businesses last year, and they're predicting it's going to be somehow greater next year. And the ransomware attackers have exfiltrated, you know, tens of billions of dollars. Uh, a lot of it's being done from Russia, which has become a cyber safe haven for criminals. Uh, you know, and there's other, it's kind of been a blended of uh, nation state attacks and different countries attacks. Very difficult to put down because you can't prosecute and stop those criminals. And uh, I really felt like the most common question out there from people that, you know, email me and I talk to her like, well, how do I, you know, what do I do if I get hit? How do I prevent it? And what do I do? What steps should I do? There's a lot of or really good organizations that help people do recovery and incident response uh, to ransomware attacks, but I didn't see anything really written out really well. So that's what, uh, what came down to the ransomware protection playbook is both uh, trying to focus on better prevention because backup is not prevention, it's recovery. And number two, what are the steps? What should you do on day, you know, hour one, day one, day two, week one, you know, the first month to recover from ransomware? What are the decisions involved? What are the things you should be doing now to prepare? That sort of stuff. Well, let's go through some of the specifics together. And, and I guess let's start at the beginning here in terms of prevention. What sort of things do you outline? Well, you know, so I call myself a data-driven defense evangelist because I believe in looking at the data of how you're most successfully attacked. Like if you're, if you find that people are breaking into your home, you're not going to stop those attackers unless you stop how they're getting into your home. So I've spent 22 years of my life looking at how attackers and malware, and in this case, ransomware successfully breaks into devices and victims and organizations and networks and people. And what I found out is that the vast majority of it, like all hacking and malware, is due to social engineering. So 50% of ransomware breaks in through some type of social engineering, usually tricking the end user into running a Trojan horse program or giving up their passwords. About 25% is due to unpatched software. 25% uh, is usually due to some type of password guessing, password hacking. And then another 25% is a whole range of things, including they actually have your password. They bought your password from some other person that compromised you. They log into your remote desktop uh, protocol connection and just put in your password and walk right on in. But I, I really looked at you know, I don't think any of the other guides really spend a significant time of looking at, well, this is how you're broken into. So this is how you need to defend yourself. Like number one, fight social engineering. If you want to stop ransomware, fight social engineering. And you'll not only put down ransomware, but the majority of other hacker and malware attacks. Let me say that I've been looking at all kinds of literature and I'm surprised by how often very authoritative sources like the FBI will say, hey, be careful. Like a couple of weeks ago, they put out Hive ransomware and they said breaks in using social engineering emails. But then in their their list of eight mitigations, none of them talked about how to prevent social engineering through email. So and hmm. let me say that that's not an outlier. That's the vast majority of ransomware protection recommendations either completely neglect social engineering or mention it last out of a list of a whole bunch of things. And so mine was kind of a, hey, look, if you look at the data, you really need to be focused on preventing social engineering and patching and having better password policy to prevent ransomware. And so I really wanted to bring the focus back to this is how people are breaking into your house. It's through the windows, not the doors. And if you don't better secure the windows, they're just going to keep getting in. 
On the social engineering front, I mean, you, as you mentioned there with the FBI, why do you suppose there's some fuzziness there? Is it, is it because it's a human factor and that's a little harder to quantify? Yeah, you know, I, I certainly think that is a big part of it. Let me say, I don't understand why people don't focus on social engineering. Social engineering has been the number one way that devices and people have been compromised since the beginning of computers, well over three decades. And yet it's not concentrated on very much. I mean, like I was, I, I've been looking at lately, I'm getting ready to release another white paper on this. I've been looking at all the top regulatory guides. So NIST and Sarbanes-Oxley and PCI DSS and GDPR and NERC and FERC and all this stuff. And as an example, in PCI DSS, you know, that's the regulatory document you have to comply with if you want to have Visa and MasterCard transactions on your network. Well, it's like a 180-page document, and it has 12 main controls. Under those 12 main controls are another, like, 230 sub-controls to meet the main control. Well, the first one they mention is having a really good firewall, which turns out hasn't worked for two decades. I mean, Almost everybody has firewalls today, and most of the attacks that target us don't care whether you have a firewall or not, but it's the first recommendation. It's eight pages of controls, 35 controls. Fighting social engineering, which is the number one thing you could concentrate on, it is mentioned as three controls in five sentences at the very end of the document. And let me say, every single document does this. They literally, not only are we doing computer security incorrectly by not focusing on the biggest threats first and best, our documents are training ourselves and the newcomers to do it wrong too. So I'm trying to be this, you know, part of this person yelling out loud, why are we doing it so badly? Like, like I don't, so it is, a, and I talk about, I've been giving these talks. I wrote a book called D Data Driven Defense a couple of years ago. I talk about it all the time about what are all the factors? Why don't we, you know, concentrate on the right things? And, you know, part of it is we, you know, it just isn't sexy enough, you know, like, like, like I, uh, one of the statistics I give in, in my book and some of my papers is that mosquito, this comes from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation a couple of years ago. More people die every day from mosquito bites than in shark attacks in, in the last hundred years. And yet there is no mosquito week on Discovery Channel. Sometimes right. <laughs> the, you know, sometimes these other attacks are just sexy or more dangerous. You know, we're all fearful of, uh, being bit by a shark or, you know, like, People are really scared. A lot of people, including myself, I fly a lot, get scared when a plane's taking off. But your odds of dying in a plane crash are like one in 12 million at best. Mm. But your odds of dying on the way to the airport that morning were like 20 times higher. But nobody's shaking and nervous in the car on the way to the airport. You know, it's just uh, humans don't really, we don't factor the fears correctly. How do you suppose then we can go at it to, to do a better job with this, to, to uh, realign our priorities? But that's exactly it. I mean, so mine is you need to focus on preventing social engineering better. I mean, that it's it's 70 in my research. It's 70 to 90 percent of all successful data breaches involve social engineering. Unpatched software is in about 20 to 40 percent. Those figures are a little bit lower in ransomware and ransomware. It's at least 50 percent uh, for social engineering and unpatched software is about 25 percent. We need to do a better job at focusing Th those two things, focusing on social engineering and better patching your software is anywhere between 75 to 99 percent of the risk in most organizations. And so if we don't focus on those two or three things, if you throw passwords in there, having better password policies or using MFA, if you throw that in there, that is absolutely 99 percent of the risk. And if you don't focus on those three things better, well, the rest of everything you do doesn't really matter. Firewalls don't work nearly as well as they say. Antivirus doesn't work as great. Something like 85% of people successfully compromised by ransomware had up-to-date running antivirus software. Uh, you know, and like, I always like, you know, the antivirus vendors are always going 100% detection, 100% detection. If that was anywhere true, we would not have malware or ransomware today, but it's mm. not true. We're being lied to. And so looking at the data, I'm trying to tell people, hey, don't look at the shiny, sexy object. Don't buy this new expensive service or new expensive thing that's supposed to fight hackers and malware and stuff like that. Concentrate, if you look at the data, concentrate on the social engineering, better patching, better password policy and MFA. Those are the three or four things that really mean everything for most organizations. And I'm, I'm just trying to be a voice in the wilderness, <laughs> shouting that out, you know, as loud as I can. What about mitigation itself? I mean, for the folks who find themselves hit with ransomware, do you have any recommendations there? Are there any things contrary to the, the you know, the common advice? 
Yeah, well, I don't know if it's so much against the common advice. I mean, there there might be, but it's more of making sure to mention the common advice. Like maybe a really common as a great example. Okay, you know you're hit by ransomware and you've got to now stop the damage, right? The first thing you want to do is stop the spreading of the ransomware, the damage that it's causing. One of the big decisions would be, you know, do I disconnect or turn or power off the machines or whatever? Well, I say, okay, go ahead and disconnect from the network, but you probably want to do it at the network device level, not at the individual device level, because that way, when you start to implement fixes or search for malware, you can turn selectively turn on networking to different devices. You don't have to manually touch each and every device. And then I go further and say, sometimes now, so there is a lot of advice that says never turn off the computers, but you could be actually having a wiperware event wiping. There is a lot of ransomware out there. Uh, or what looks like ransomware that is really wiperware where, you know, there's been entire companies decimated because they thought it was a ransomware event. It, it posed as a ransomware event. It took out the country of U- Ukraine <laughs> for mm-hmm. one. Uh, and it says, oh, we're ransomware and we're collecting this. But if you looked at the code, it was really wiperware. And Saudi Arabia and Aramco has been hit by this a couple of times. So the common advice is never turn off the machines. Well, that's not true. That's, that may be true if you've just got traditional ransomware, but there are times where you have wiperware and it does hit different organizations. It hits Sony Pictures, it hit Aramco, it hit uh, the entire country of Ukraine. Well, then you want to turn your machines off. It isn't a simple yes or no. It really depends on the scenario. So I kind of present the scenarios and say, okay, this is what you should do. Oh, and if you do need to disconnect the network, do it at the network level and not at the device level. That sort of advice. Can you give us your, your insights on backups themselves? What what, uh, what advice do you have there? Number one, they're not a prevention control. They're an incident response recovery control. But you should have a good backup and you should have what's called 321, which means you have the copies of the data in at least three places, the original place the data is, and then in two backup locations. That's the three. The two is you should have them on two different types of media Meaning that, you know, the idea is that if the attacker gets to one, maybe they don't get to the other. And then the one is one should be stored offline. And let me say the the biggest thing, the biggest mistake I see is a lot of people think their offline backup is offline when it's not. I'm amazed. I ask many people, hey, do you have an offline backup? They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, see probably 75% of the hands come up. I go, can you get to your offline backup? do an online console to restore it. And almost all the same hands come up. I'm like, it's not offline. If you can get to it in an online console and it doesn't take someone physically doing something separately, then it's not an offline backup. And if you can get to it, the attacker can get to it. And so a lot of people that get hit by ransomware, when they initially get hit, the IT people are like, hey, we've got a backup. Don't you worry. Well, they've never tested the backup. They've never tested it against every, like, turns out even if they have the backup, and I'm not making this up, many times after they do a test restore during the recovery, it shows that it's going to take a thousand years to restore all those machines. Right, right. But more, more importantly, a lot of times they tell the CEO, don't you, don't you worry, we've got backups. And then they find out the backups were corrupted or encrypted or deleted or whatever. So uh, most people are not doing what's called three, two, one backups, making sure that one's offline. And they're not, they haven't really done, uh, they're like, oh, I've done a restore. I've done a test. Like, and let me say, that's everybody's compliance checklist. Have you done, you know, do you got good backups and you test that they work? Yeah. It means they tested like one file, one folder, one server, but have they tested trying to restore every single server they have, like in the scenario of what ransomware is likely to hit? No, absolutely not. Most companies have not done that. And how do we know this is the case? Because uh, some, some Somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of the victims are paying the ransom now. And, you know, even in the the lowest times, I think it was 40 percent, 40 to 60 percent. And that means that a lot of people did not have the backups that they thought they had. Yeah. I mean, I I guess to be fair, it's hard to to know where that sweet spot is in terms of you know, balancing your your risk versus the amount of energy you your finances and so on that you're going to put into your backup plan. Uh, and it's hard to know exactly where to dial that in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, you're exactly right. But I, I tell you, the part that's embarrassing to me is that every compliance guideline in the world says, do you have uh, tested backups, you know, that you and you do test restores? And everybody's saying yes, checking, okay, we're in compliance. 
And most people are lying, and even the auditors kind of know they're lying, because to do that would take a significant amount of resources. Like, suppose you had a dedicated full-time equivalent, FTE, that was doing backups. You'd not only need a second full-time employee to do this, but you would have to have the money and resources to be able to do the backup and restoration and restore it. You know, let's say you're backing up 800 servers. You would have to then do a test restore of those 800 servers to another environment that costs money and it takes time and it really, most people are not doing it anywhere. It's a cost benefit, but it, I do find it ironic and or sad that our entire computer security industry, our, our cyber resiliency is based at the bare minimum on the fact that we all have good backups for disaster recovery and business continuity. And the, it, I think it is a, a revealed myth that we actually have these good secure tested backups. And I think so we need to, as a world or an industry, decide, are we going to do backups the right way, the correct way that we've always said that we're doing them? Or are we going to continue in this kind of fake myth that we're doing them really well, but we're not? I mean, it, it, and it's all right if we go, you know what, we looked at the cost, we looked at the benefit, and it's not really worth it to do this full, you know, the way that we've been saying we're doing it. We we should just stop lying about it. The first step of the problem is to be honest with ourselves <laughs> and then go, you know what, we looked at it and it's just too expensive to do it the way that we're supposed to do it. And so we're going to kind of halfway do it. I think it's all right to say they're going to halfway do it. What I think's wrong is to say that we're doing it completely the right way and, and checking compliance checklist and everything, everything's great. And then, oh, and then when they hit by ransomware, it turns out, oh, our backups aren't working or we'll take a thousand years to restore or whatever it might be. All right, Joe, what do you think? Wow. Tens of billions of dollars lost to ransomware. Mm -hmm. I I am not at all surprised by that number. Uh, I think that is probably, you know, this is like we often say on this show, this cybercrime is 95% of it is financially motivated. And and the Verizon data breach investigation report talks about that every single year. And ransomware is remarkably effective at getting people to cough up money. Mm-hmm. Uh, Roger makes a great point about backups. It's not prevention. It's a recovery. It's an instant response tool. Mm-hmm. The important part to remember about ransomware is, is that it is essentially just the last step of an attack all the time. When you, when you have an attack that, that ends in ransomware, there has been tons of other stuff that's been going on, and you're looking at the end of the incident at that point right. in time. Right. Uh, and somewhere that incident has a starting point. I like the breakdown that Roger provides on initial infection vector for these incidents. The the biggest one is social engineering. Somebody says, hey, here, run this, right? Mm -hmm, (laughs) And mm -hmm. it's some kind of Trojan horse that does something. A lot of times it's just something that provides uh, like a backdoor to these attackers Uh, because it's not just going to be the encryptor that that you're asked to run. That's that's not really very helpful to these attackers. It's going to be something that lets them in so they can explore your network and then Once they know where all your valuable data is, they're going to start encrypting it. But before they do that, they're going to take it. Yeah. The rest of the vectors of initial attack are split pretty evenly between unpatched software, password compromise, and other access methods like brokered access, right? Uh, Like somebody Mm -hmm. has gotten into this account, and then they're just going to sell that access. One of the interesting points that Roger makes in this that is spot on is recommendations for prevention – generally neglect the social engineering angle. They talk about Hmm. the, what he calls the shiny object, the sexy thing, you know, Hey, look at this firewall. You know, firewalls are great at preventing like port scanning of things inside your system. Right. Mm -hmm. But you still have to have that service open to the internet and the firewall generally lets that go through, especially Mm -hmm. if that traffic is encrypted, right. Through something like SSL. Um, unless you have the firewall opening up and inspecting all the packets. And even then you're still not hundred percent protected. Right. So because if I can just send somebody an email and say, run this email for me and convince them to do it or run this attachment for me and convince them to do it, then I've just bypassed everything because a lot of these firewalls don't stop outbound connections because that stops people from from using their computers like they normally do. Right. Sure. So, I mean, that's how you get around a firewall is you just ask somebody on the inside to get around the firewall for you and they do it. 
And that's the sure. social engineering aspect. And Roger's 100% correct. That is neglected. And he talks about the PCI DSS that talks about it in three lines or three sentences at the end of the, at the, end of the document, right? But spends an entire section on talking about firewalls. It's a great point and a great observation. And it's really something that you and I have been championing for now three years, right? But it is something the industry, I think, is still missing. They're, they're, they're getting better at it, but they're still not good enough, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, three things to do for prevention. I like what he says here. Social engineering training, mandatory. I think that is probably the biggest payback for a uh, return on investment that you can get. Uh, software patching, a good patching program is a is a real bonus. And then good password policy or multi-factor authentication. And I just say, if you're going to do one of these things, multi-factor authentication is, is going to be the best thing. You should also do uh, uh, software patching and social engineering training, but multi-factor authentication can stop a lot of these low effort social engineering attacks in their tracks, particularly with account yeah. takeover things. Um, I think that's where your biggest uh, the biggest bang for your buck in a product comes from in training, definitely software uh, or social engineering training. And then software patching is free. You just have to have the process and the people inside to manage it. I mean, but you know, all the software you already pay licensing fees for, you should be updating that whenever there's a vulnerability that comes out or whenever a new version comes out. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes easier said than done in a, in a, it, it is you know, uh, act, active environment, but sure. The point is correct. well taken. Right, you need a good you you need you need a good software patching program, uh, and configuration management program around it. But these things, what's interesting about these things is these things are all very mundane things, right? They're not like the superstar latest cool product thing. They're the basics, and yeah. we're we're not doing it well. And then he goes on to talk about backups. I like his three two one backup model. That's great. Data in three places: the original place, a backup, and a second backup. Two different types of media, right? Uh, so, you know, you have it on disc and maybe you have it on tape as well. And then one mm -hmm. of those backups has to be offline. Uh, and that's, that's critical. And when you say offline, when he says offline, that means that it has to be, um, you know, it's not accessible. You can't just go, oh, well, here it is. It's over here on this computer. That's not offline. Offline is in a tape or some media that you've taken out of a computer and it physically can't be touched. It's air gapped, uh, and not even powered on actually. Yeah. Yeah, you know, there are no powers. Yeah, it can't just to it. be an unmounted volume because right. a lot of the malware these days will go and look for unmounted volumes and right. mount Absolutely. them. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. That's uh, this was a great interview, Dave. I liked a lot of what Roger had to say. I think he is a champion of of uh, common sense in the security industry, and I really appreciate uh, his his perspective. All right. Well, again, our thanks to uh, Roger Grimes for joining us. We do appreciate him taking the time. We want to thank all of you for listening, and we'd like to thank our sponsor, Know Before, the provider of the world's largest security awareness training and simulated phishing platform. CEO fraud is not going away anytime soon, but there are ways to address this problem. Look up Know Before to learn more about their new school approach to security awareness training, and check out their free domain spoof test tool at knowbefore.com DST to see if your work email addresses are vulnerable to spoofing. That is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. Our thanks to the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute for their participation. You can learn more at isi.jhu.edu. The Hacking Humans podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our senior producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Joe Kerrigan. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.